Hi, I'm Jim Smyrniotopoulos, and this is MedPick's Case of the Week, number 647. We have no significant disclosures. This week's patient is a 41-year-old woman who presented with progressive onset of bilateral arm pain and upper extremity weakness. She has a known congenital syndrome. These two sagittal T2 weighted images demonstrate expansion of the cervical cord at the C2-C3 level with a heterogeneous water signal intensity mass. Following the administration of contrast material, there is patchy enhancement of portions of the lesion. So what is this likely going to be? This is a patient who has neurofibromatosis type 2. Neurofibromatosis is conveniently divided up into several different types, the most common being neurofibromatosis type 1, which was described by von Recklinghausen and eponymically bears his name. NF1 is characterized by multiple neurofibromas that may be cutaneous and spinal or paraspinal. The patients also have prominent cutaneous findings, typically macular, hyperpigmentation, or cafe au lait spots, and this disorder is associated with a mutation on the long arm of chromosome 17. In contrast, neurofibromatosis type 2, which was formerly described as having bilateral acoustic neuromas and oftentimes is described as central neurofibromatosis, has minimal cutaneous manifestations, which are actually skin tagged, and is carried on a totally different mutation on the long arm of chromosome number 22. There are 22 letters and numbers in the words neurofibromatosis type 2, and most patients have bilateral vestibular schwannomas, so all of the twos go together with NF2. In considering neurofibromatosis type 1 and neurofibromatosis type 2 and their genetics, we must remember that when we study Mendelian inheritance, we match up groups of patients by their families, and families are grouped by their surnames. Neurofibromatosis type 1 and neurofibromatosis type 2 have the same first name, neurofibromatosis, and the same middle name, type, but they have different last names, 1 and 2, because they come from different families with different mutations. CNS neoplasms associated with neurofibromatosis type 2 are categorized by a loss of heterozygosity, the schwannoma, the meningioma, and the ependymoma. So it's natural to relate the systemic deletion of chromosome 22 with the formation of these three neoplasms. In contrast, patients who have NF1, who have a mutation in chromosome number 17, primarily developed neurofibromas, the diffuse type of astrocytoma in the cerebral hemispheres and cerebellum, and they also develop pilocytic astrocytomas of the optic nerve, the optic nerve glioma. Neurofibromatosis type 2 has been called Wishart's disease. He was the first to describe this disorder in 1822. It's also called the MISMI syndrome, and we'll explain that abbreviation shortly. The prevalence of NF2 is much less common than NF1 at approximately 1 in 50,000. And chromosome 22 is described as coding for a, a gene that relates to a protein called neurofibromin, but that protein is also called schwannomin or Merlin. Again, the incidence of NF2 is much less common than NF1. The primary symptoms at presentation in patients not known to have the disorder by family history is high-frequency hearing loss from the vestibular schwannomas. The CNS findings in these patients are multiple because they have an inherited gene mutation, deletion, and the neoplasms are schwannoma, meningioma, and ependymoma, which is typically intramedullary within the spinal cord. That's why NF2 is oftentimes called the MISMI syndrome. The NIH diagnostic criteria include either the presence of bilateral eighth nerve masses or a first degree relative with the same disorder and either unilateral eighth nerve mass or a first degree relative and any two from the short list that includes meningioma, glioma, again usually an ependymoma, schwannoma, congenital lens opacity, or neurofibromas. At least that's what was in the NIH diagnostic criteria. The distinction between NF1 and NF2 was made genetically in the 1980s. One of the two Sentinel articles was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. A group of patients from the Gulf of Mexico 
23 individuals, 18 of them were described as having bilateral acoustic schwannomas, now we call these vestibular schwannomas, 8 of the patients had meningioma, 3 with multiple tumors, 4 patients had ependymoma, and 2 of the patients were described as having neurofibromas, although they probably actually had more complicated schwannomas and not neurofibromas. Schwannomas originate from Schwann cells, and in humans, the most common site of origin for a schwannoma is going to be the inferior division of the vestibular nerve. These tumors begin as small intracanalicular filling defects that enhance inside of the internal auditory canal. The cisternal portions of the eighth nerve do not have Schwann cells, and therefore the tumors always arise inside of the internal auditory canal. Here is a patient with NF2 as bilateral vestibular schwannomas. The one on the patient's left is filling the internal auditory canal. The literature over time from 1986 to 2007 and to 2008 has progressively refined our understanding of the location and site of origin of the schwannomas as being within the inferior division of the vestibular nerve. We want to remember that these patients have a genetic predisposition, so they may form multiple schwannomas, in this case bilateral vestibular schwannomas. Although the center of the bulk of the mass is in the cerebellopontine angle cistern, we wish to remember that the tumors always begin inside of the internal auditory canal because that's where the Schwann cells live. And this tumor also has the classic shape of an ice cream cone with three scoops in the cistern, but ice cream packed in the cone, which is the enlargement, the funnel-shaped enlargement of the internal auditory canal. Schwannomas are slowly growing tumors. They classically present in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, but they will present at a much younger age in patients who have this genetic predisposition. They classically arise from sensory rather than motor nerve roots. The overwhelming majority of solitary schwannomas are sporadic tumors, but any patient with multiple schwannomas probably has the chromosome 22 mutation that gives us the disorder called neurofibromatosis type 2. Here is another patient with bilateral vestibular schwannomas, an older case. The tumors achieved a quite dramatic size before the patient had their first imaging study to make the diagnosis. Fortunately, this is from a different patient from the archive of the AFIP, again showing bilateral vestibular schwannomas slowly growing and compressing the brain stem over time. Here is yet another patient with NF type 2. This patient has bilateral cerebellopontine angle 8th nerve schwannomas and also a third tumor involving the trigeminal nerve inside of the cavernous sinus. When we think about neurofibromatosis type 2, we want to remember that they have these lesions in the cerebellopontine angle cistern that begin in the internal auditory canal, the 8th nerve schwannomas. They may also have lesions that are not touching or arising from a nerve, such as this tentorial lesion and the lesion wrapped around the fox. Both of these are going to be meningiomas. In the axial plane, we see bilateral 8th nerve tumors and a tentorial rounded mass, which is the meningioma. And that's part of the reason why we call this the MISMI disease. The third component of the neoplastic processes in NF2 is an intramedullary lesion, most commonly seen in the cervical spinal cord, and this is going to be an ependymoma. So neurofibromatosis type 2 causes multiple lesions because of an inherited gene mutation, and the histology the pathology of those lesions is schwannoma, meningioma, and ependymoma, and that is also the relative frequency with which patients will harbor. So that is why we call neurofibromatosis type 2 the MISMI syndrome. These patients have a genetic predisposition for making multiple lesions. They have inherited a mutation, an autosomal dominant mutation on the long arm of chromosome 22. The histology of these lesions is schwannoma meningioma, and ependymoma. So we call it the MISMI syndrome to help us remember the lesions that occur, and that is also the relative frequency of these lesions. More schwannomas, some meningiomas, and least common are going to be symptomatic intramedullary spinal cord ependymomas. So our patient for this MedPIC case of the week had a known uh, syndrome, which was neurofibromatosis type 2, and the patient presented with upper extremity signs and symptoms related to the expansion of the intramedullary spinal cord ependymoma. Ependymomas are relatively uncommon CNS neoplasms, less than 2% of the total. The incidence is about uh, 
0.26 per 100,000 patients per year. They occur in one-third to one-half of patients who have NF2, but they're typically not symptomatic. The vast majority of them, two-thirds up to 85%, will involve the cervical spinal cord. And symptomatic and growing lesions are more common in patients with nonsense and frame shift mutations. This has been a MedPix case of the week. We thank you for your time and attention. I'm Jim Smyrniotopoulos, and I have approved this message.